Cash Flow Diary Podcast, Episode 89. Congratulations, you showed up. Give yourself a high five in celebration of your success. Welcome to the Cash Flow Diary, where new and experienced investors come to take confident action towards their goals. Your host is a family man, a real estate entrepreneur, investor, coach, and instructor. As a master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's Cash Flow 101 game, he's inspired many to begin their journey into creating cash flow for themselves and their family. And now, here he is to offer you the tools required to earn the income desired. Your cash flow coach, Jay Massey. All right, and welcome to another episode of the Cash Flow Diary Podcast. I am your host, Jay Massey, and you know what? You're going to be surprised because I'm excited. Nope, nope, yep, I really am. No, (laughs) I know. You're probably wondering, when are you not excited, Jay? Well, you will understand that today. One of the things that I've often told you guys is that the political environment is something that you need to pay attention to. The financial environment is absolutely critical to your investing and lots of the decisions that you're already making. Unfortunately, you're making them blindly, but most importantly, we're now going to shed some light under the hood of the financial system. And today's guest is the perfect person to help with that because it is definitely one of those important things that's happening to all of us. And unless you are paying attention, you might get hit in a way that you're not expecting. But before we go there, for those of you joining us for the first time, go over to learninvestingnow.com. Guess what's there? I'm gonna teach you to learn investing now. And that's exactly what's there for you so that you have the ability to get started on your journey to becoming a bigger, better, badder real estate investor. And what's exciting is that it's just the beginning of your journey. Now, today's guest is uh, the co-host of the Real Estate Guys radio show. You should definitely check them out. They also have a TV show. He's an author, an entrepreneur, financial strategist, love that, real estate investor, former finance instructor for California Realtors Association, GRI program. That's a long way of saying really smart dude. And I hope that you get as much from him as he has given to me in so many different ways. I am absolutely proud to call him a friend and a mentor in so many ways. I think you will love him too. So do me a favor and welcome Mr. Russell Gray. Russ, you there? Hey Jay, how you doing? I am. I'm excited. I, I can't. I know it sounds funny. I mean, so people, if they're looking at the title episode, they're like, "How can Jay be so excited about talking about the Fed and money and all of these other things?" And I, I want to jump straight into that. But before we do, uh, I often say that today's entrepreneurs are like yesterday's superheroes. And every superhero has a beginning, what we call an origin story. You know, before Superman was Superman, he was something else. What I'd love to know, and I'd love for everyone to hear in your own words, is before Russell Gray was Russell Gray, who was Russell Gray? Right, right, right. Well, you know, I I was raised by a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, and I was reading Anne Rand, Atlas Shrugged, and Fountainhead, and a lot of that free market thinking type stuff while I was in grade school. And so that had a big wow. shape. Yeah, had, had a big effect on, you know, kind of how I looked at life. I had my first job when I was barely 14 years old. I had to lie about my age to get it. Uh, kind of always worked, loved working, <clears throat> loved making money. And as soon as I got old enough to buy a house, I went and did that, started a business. A year and a half later, sold both of those for a profit, discovered equity. And that was such an exciting concept. My wife and I made more money owning the property and owning the business than we did working (laughs) during that period of time. Uh, I got into all of that through a mentorship. And so I learned to get a real appreciation for that. I tried college for a little bit, went back after several years. Actually, we'd already had our first child. And I went back to college because I thought I wanted to be a teacher, and it looked like my dad's company was going to go public, and he was going to be fabulously wealthy, and I could maybe be a trust fund kid, and I could (laughs) teach. Um, But that didn't work out, and it was my first real experience with a recession in, uh, in 1984. And so I went into corporate sales and raised my family, and in 1985 or six, I went into the financial services business. And became really enamored of that. And I started doing a lot of studying and reading of 
prospectuses and mutual funds. And, you know, anybody who knows me knows I'm a researcher. And my dad took a second run at taking his company public, and that happened in 1987. And then I had another profound experience. I was actually working in the financial services industry at the time. I had an insurance brokerage, and I was selling mutual funds and setting up small retirement accounts for individuals and companies. And then the 1987 stock market crash hit, and I watched my dad lose $12 million. And I thought to myself, how is it that a guy can be smart enough to start a company, take it public, be worth tens of millions of dollars and lose it all in a day. And I began to realize that there was uh, a lot of landmines in, in the Wall Street and conventional arena. And it was, a, it was a real shock for me. So a couple of years later, I ended up getting out of the financial services business, going back into corporate sales um, because I learned another great lesson about life at that time, and that is uh, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should, and there's a lot more to life than simply trying to make money. And that was where I started to uh, consider purpose in the things that I did. Hmm. Uh, I got, went back into corporate sales, did well, and made a lot of money, and then one day I looked at my uh, tax return. I paid you know, over $50,000 in taxes one year. And that was, a, you know, I, I looked at that, I said, you know, gosh, people work a full-time job to earn 50000 and I paid that much in tax. <laughs> right. So right. it probably is worth my time to try to figure out how to mitigate that. And that started me down a whole other path. Concurrent to that, we were homeschooling our children, and I was kind of responsible for government, civics, uh, history, economics. And I started studying that on my own and discovered all these things that I had never been taught in school. Mm. And it opened my eyes, and I started going to these seminars and conferences, uh, much like what is today's Freedom Fest, which is something I do every year now, which is fabulous. Just got off that this last weekend, which was amazing. Mm -hmm. And you start listening to these people and their ideas and their philosophies, which really resonated with me going all the way back to my childhood, growing up reading, you know, Ayn Rand. And uh, and so I, I kind of went through that process and, and, and decided I wanted to get back into the financial services industry. Uh, but now for purpose, I wanted to get in so I could begin to teach people the financial system, which I had discovered to be largely corrupt and that the political back and forth between Democrats and Republicans was really unfortunate because we had so much more in common than we had to argue about. And yet it seemed that we were constantly being divided. Well, we were completely missing the main problem. And uh, along the line, I went and heard a guy named Erwin Schiff, who was talking about the corruption of the tax system. Mm -hmm. And at the same time I was reading his books, I was reading a book by uh, G. Edward Griffin called The Creature from Jekyll Island. Mm -hmm. And that book opened my eye up to the Federal Reserve and the Federal Reserve system. And so that's really where I, I kind of decided what I wanted to do. And in 1999, I understood enough about macroeconomics to realize with the baby boom generation, uh, the natural progression of asset allocation modeling in the conventional financial planning world would have baby boomers moving from equities into bonds. Uh, and that meant that the bond market would be flush with cash. That would mean bond prices would go up, yields would go down, interest rates would be low. And I decided to go into the mar mortgage business. And I went into the mortgage business in 2000. And that was really great right up until it wasn't. <laughs> because in 2008, as we know, the bond markets imploded and uh, took most of the economy with it. And that set me off on an even larger quest. And I think it's right along those that timeline, Jay, that you and I got to know each other as we were coming through right. the, the recession, uh, the Great Recession. And uh, I really made it my point to hang around with the smartest guys I could find and really understand, uh, you know, kind of at a mechanical level, what went on in those financial markets, what really controlled interest rates and the supply of money. Because at the end of the day, money or currency really is the proper term, is, is the lifeblood of the, the circulatory system. There's no commerce. There's no economy without a medium of exchange or currency. And the body that controls all of that, really for the world, because of the dollar is the reserve, uh, the reserve uh, currency of the world, is the Federal Reserve. Oh, and that yeah. that yeah. really opened my eye up to that whole thing. And now when you understand what the Fed is doing and how to connect what goes on at Wall Street and Washington and, and, and at the Eccles building in the Federal Reserve and how that really uh, 
trickles down, and I don't know that that's the right term, but really affects Main Street. What goes on over there really affects the Main Street investor. And I spent a lot of time over the last many years trying to help people understand how these macro things matter to you in your everyday real estate investing business. Exactly. And that's exactly why he's here today, ladies and gentlemen, is because he does this better than anyone I know. And he helped me understand it to a level that uh, he's one of the only individuals that I've ever seen that has the ability to actually sp- explain how the Fed works. And you go, oh, I get it. And how money works and go, oh, that makes sense. And then you have actionable information uh, to go with. And, and and if you've heard already, hopefully you're paying attention, but you heard already four books that he's already mentioned between Atlas Shrugged, Fountainhead, Erwin Schiff, Erwin Schiff's book and the creature from Jekyll Island, you can already tell he's well studied, well read. Those are always hints, by the way. Don't wait for him or me to say, hey, you need to go get those. You probably should. But there's a question I, I've got to ask you, Russ, is because your 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 journey thus far has been filled with what I call pivoting. It's like we, we're aiming for this one goal, trying to get somewhere, and then boom, something happens, and yet you recover and find a way to operate under new conditions. How do you, in essence, know where to go next when the opportunity you thought was great turns out not to be? Well, I have a quote that I hope someday I will be known for that has really helped me, and that is when you have clarity of vision, strategy and tactics become evident. And the concept there is that when you're really clear about what a finished product looks like, what success is, what you want to accomplish, when you're really clear about that, then even though everything around you is shifting sand and there's so many variables, you could never make a concrete step-by-step plan. You have to be able to think on your feet. And in those moments of decision where you're at crossroads or an opportunity comes in front of us, Uh, A lot of people either don't know which way to go or completely miss the fact that there's an opportunity available because they aren't clear enough in their vision. Whenever I find myself confused, disoriented, or even discouraged, I always go back and I don't try to figure out what to do, try to figure out what I'm trying to accomplish. And in my case, you know, the bigger, biggest picture for me is I want people to understand the system that they operate in because it touches every aspect of their life. I mean, if you think about it, when people get up every day, most people get up every day and go to work and they go to work to make money. And then when they're not at work, they're thinking about ways they need to spend that money and hopefully invest that money. And so everything that they want in life, most of the gifts they want to give, the things they want to accomplish, the security they want to feel, uh, all of the things that they want to do largely involve money. And if you don't understand money at the core, it's going to be difficult to make a good decision. Let me give you one example that way I try to explain to people what money is versus currency. And that is, if you were to take and put a uh, 1964 quarter in your left hand and a 1965 quarter in your right hand, and you were to hold your hands out to someone and say, in 1965, both of these quarters would purchase one gallon of gasoline. In 2014, only one will. Do you know which one and why? Because if you don't know the difference between one, which is money, and one, which is only currency, and you're getting up every day to earn currency, and you're trying to save and invest currency, and you're measuring your prosperity in terms of currency, you could end up down the road with a lot less than you think. You might have more dollars than you ever had in your life, but you can't buy anything with them because of the loss of purchasing power because currency didn't perform the function of money, which is to store value over long periods of time. Oh, and and those are the, and see, now you, you guys are beginning to understand exactly why I get so excited about this is because understanding not just what you see on the news, CNN, as we all know, is constant negative news, right? Uh, Not just that, how to take an action step uh, based upon what you're receiving and seeing is key and being able to read the system and understand how it works. Now, uh, I happen to know, have inside knowledge, you talk about this thing, the ebb and flow, ebb and flow. That for me was eye-opening in terms of 
understanding just what happens when the Fed is printing. So eventually, I want to, I want to eventually end up there. I, I do. But you made a comment about, you know, helping people to understand the system that they operate in. Can you expound a little bit more about what you mean by the system in that regard? Yeah, I mean, our system fundamentally changed in 1913 with the passage of the 16th Amendment. And there's a whole group of people who uh, I think have made a pretty strong case that the 16th Amendment was never actually ratified. It shouldn't be the law of the land, but be that as it may, for all practical purposes, it is. And it's that 16th Amendment that gave us the Internal Revenue Service, which prior to 1913, which is a pretty long history in these United States, we didn't have an income tax with the exception of uh, Abraham Lincoln imposing an income tax to finance the Civil War. And I'll do a whole thing on that too. But uh, <laughs> but in 1913 we got uh, we got the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, we got the Federal Reserve, and it was really called the Federal Reserve Act. Uh, we got uh, concurrent to that, not in that same piece of legislation. We got the United Nations, or what became the United Nations, and shortly thereafter we found ourselves embroiled in World War One. And you might think all of these things are not you know, associated with each other, but I would make the argument they are. But what happened in 1913 is that the U.S. Congress gave authority to the Federal Reserve, which is not a federal agency at all. It's a, it's a cartel of privately owned banks. They don't have any reserves except for their ability to print money, which was granted to them by Congress. Uh, and they're not really a bank um, in the way you would think of a bank. Uh, so, you know, the, the name itself is kind of a misnomer, but what ended up happening now is the Federal Reserve had the ability to determine how much money would be in circulation. And, and again, come back to this concept for, you know, especially the younger listeners. I gave the earlier example of the, the 1964 quarter and the 1965 quarter, but didn't really explain what the differences was. The 1964 quarter is made of silver. The 1965 quarter was the first year that they gave us zinc-clad copper, which is basically a penny painted over to look like a quarter. And, of course, didn't have any metallic value. And the silver retained its value over time. And, of course, the quarter that wasn't metal or precious metal didn't. Well, it was the same thing. The paper notes that we carry around are called Federal Reserve Notes. Back in the beginning, they were redeemable for real gold and silver, so they were really coupons. They were, they were certificates or proofs of ownership, and it was payable to bearer on demand one dollar of silver, which had a very specific weight. Uh, and that's what money was. And, and so the ability to print more coupons than there was real metal is the power that the Federal Reserve got. And of course, that didn't all blow up until 1971 where we that come through the 1960s spending way more money than we could afford to on the Vietnam War and the war on poverty, you know, a great society that Lyndon Johnson put in place. And uh, we had people all over the world bringing those dollars back to the United States and purchasing our gold at $35 an ounce. And Richard Nixon went on television on August 15th, 1971, and told the world he was closing the gold window, which is really a euphemism for defaulting on those obligations, all those IOUs, those notes that we had supplied to the world that said we would give them back gold, we said, well, we're not going to do it anymore, and we're the biggest economy and the biggest army, and if you don't like it, sucks to be you. <laughs> totally. And that's kind of what happened. And if you go back and look at what happened after the 1971 default on gold in terms of the national debt and purchasing price of the dollar, it was horrific. And, of course, as soon as dollar, the dollar... I'm sorry, as soon as gold was uh, delinked from this arbitrary $35 rate, it skyrocketed up to $850 an ounce in just a matter of a couple of years. Yeah, I mean, with about eight years. Well, it, that, was, it was trying to hold its real value. It took a lot more dollars to buy the same goods. And that's really the definition of inflation. It takes more dollars to buy the same product. And it didn't mean the product became worth less. Because value is utility, all right? A gallon of gas is still a gallon of gas. A pound of beef is still a pound of beef. A three-bedroom, two-bath home will still sleep three people. That doesn't change. What's changed is how many dollars it takes to own those things, which means the price or the value of the dollar dropped. And that's the key concept that every investor 
has to understand, Jay, when you were in financial planning, a right. big part of helping somebody figure out what they needed 20 or 30 or 40 years from now when you're doing a financial plan for them was taking into account a thing called inflation and adjusting so that they would, you know, think, oh, man, if I could make $5,000 a month in retirement, that would be great. Well, what are you going to need in 40 years at $5,000 a month, $25,000, $30,000 a month? Yeah, you had to figure out the number, what the, it was always a challenge to figure out what inflation, it was always a guess. What's inflation going to be? I don't know. Oh, hi. <laughs> yeah, and it starts with the premise of even understanding what inflation is. A lot of people don't even understand. We're so accustomed to it, you know, that we we have a whole generation of people that have never seen real money. They have no idea what real money is. Yes. And, you know what's funny about you saying that? There have been times where I, uh, in a presentation or something, I is I will take real money to the to the presentation and i will hold up like a hundred dollar bill uh versus a gold coin or or something of that nature and so many people take the hundred dollar bill so many people would prefer to have it because they know what it is and what it can be exchanged for and used it's it's well it's interesting and um you know, because there, there's so much information that we are not given, as you said, uh, things that you weren't taught in school that we that rely on self-education, rely on you listening to a podcast to be able to go, what are they talking about? Is that for real? So answer me this. Um, how does all of this, I mean, because listening to you talk in that last little bit, I, you know, it's maybe I should go buy gold. How does how does this relate to to real estate uh, and, 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 or do I buy gold? What, what, what's the deal here? Help me out. It, it, it's a real, it's a bigger picture. So let's go back to the 1964 versus 1965 quarter. If you would have had a roll of quarters in 1965 and, you know, roll of silver quarters, 1964 or earlier quarters, and you decided to, um, put, uh, you said, well, okay, these, this would buy me 40 gallons of gas because mm-hmm. there's 40 quarters in there. Uh, I think that's right. Uh, anyway, so however many quarters are in there, it would buy you X numbers of gas, right? Um, and so now you would, if you were to put that money into the bank and, and put your $10 in the bank and then withdraw it in 2014, you could only buy maybe three gallons of gas. And so the reason you saved the money was because you didn't want the gas then, you wanted the gas later. But you, it was easier to store the money than it was to store the gas. But if you knew that the money was only going to buy three gallons of gas, would you have been better off actually buying the gas and storing it? Does that make sense? Yeah, perfect. Okay. I got it. In other words, the gas is is a real product. It, it has real value. It's, it, it, it's something tangible. The quarters were real because the silver is real. It has real value and it retains its value, whereas the the paper money that would have been issued or the the IOU that the bank would have given you wouldn't have held its value. So if you were to know that that was the case and you were sitting there looking at a bank account full of dollars, what do you think the logical thing to do would to to do with those dollars, you know, during whatever period of time, 10, 20, 30 year period of time? I'm going to put it in something that has uh, something that has more utility value, something that has real value. That's right. You're going to buy something real. And I call those things real assets. So gold doesn't produce income, doesn't cash flow. No. A lot of people who think, oh, it's not a good investment. I agree. It's not an investment. It's a store of value. It serves the purpose of money, which currency currently doesn't do. Hold on. Hold on. I got to stop you right there. Okay. For all of you who have emailed me time and time again, now you know what I've been saying about gold and why. Please continue. <laughs> that was for me, public service announcement type of thing, because we get the email, Jay, gold or real estate, gold or real estate. And yes. Uh, it's please. not an either or. That's like saying dollars or real estate, dollars or real estate. You buy real estate to produce dollars. You buy real estate to produce money. See, because if you think about it, what you're doing is you're purchasing a piece of real estate, not because you want to own the real estate, but because you want a piece of the labor of the occupant of the the real estate. That person is going to get up every day and go to work for somebody, produce something and get paid compensation. uh, You know what we would call money, but really currency. But they're going to get paid a paycheck and a percentage of that paycheck is going to end up being given to you for the use of your property. 
So effectively, those people work for you, or at least part-time for you. Mm -hmm. Maybe about 30% of their time, they're working for you. And that's what you're trying to acquire when you purchase a piece of real estate. And so when you end up with the fruit of their labor, the question is, is what do you do with it? Well, obviously, you want to continue to reinvest it. You buy more real estate and acquire more streams of income. But there are quite a lot of dollars you're sitting on in the in-between. I call that the float. So you collect security deposits. You put away contingency reserves for replacing roofs or repaving parking lots or uh, you know, replacing water heaters or dishwashers or on and on, all the things that we, you know, have as real estate investors. And, you know, if you were to look at your checkbook on any given day, depending on how big your portfolio, you might have 100,000, 200,000, 500,000 kind of average daily balance, you know, just always in your account. Doing and well. on a bad day, you might go down to, you know, maybe half that. And so you say, okay, well, I probably could take the bottom 20 or 30 percent of that float and store it in real money because it's always going to be there and I can always convert it back into dollars. This is the issue of liquidity. So where can I store my money where it, it or store my dollars? How can I convert my dollars into something that's real that will remain highly liquid that I could then convert back into dollars quickly if I needed them? And most of the time we don't because the float is always there. Unless your business is atrophying and your cash flows are shrinking, the float should be growing, right? And so I think that, that precious metals can serve that purpose over an extended period of time. You can't wig out over the little ups and downs. You know, if you look at the trend line of the dollar from inception in 1913, it's been down. I mean, it's clearly down. And right. if you look at the trend line of gold since then, it's been clearly up because it's the inverse, because one is money and one is currency. And as a currency drops, anything of real value goes up denominated in dollars. This is the danger of thinking that you're wealthy because you have a lot of dollars or thinking that you're wealthy because your assets are denominated well in a lot of dollars. So the real asset investing philosophy is about accumulating units of value, more units of dollar. I want more ounces of gold. I want more ounces of silver. I want more rental units, doors coming in, tenants, people working for me. I want more barrels of oil. I want more uh, pounds of coffee or barrels of wheat or you know whatever it is that I'm 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 investing in uh, that is going to retain its value and, and you know and unfortunately you just can't go put your money in the bank to retain value over the long term because the dollar itself is corrupt and that's the core system and that's the core problem and until we change like we just interviewed Steve Forbes just last weekend the show will be out in a couple weeks and uh, he's been calling in his latest book for the return to the gold standard. The idea that we have to have sound money. His concept is, you know, can you imagine if you got every day, like you and I scheduled this interview. Yes. yes. If the unit value, if the amount of time contained in an hour <laughs> was changing on a daily basis, you're yeah. making a decision, <clears throat> excuse me, about where to spend your time. I'm making a decision about where to spend my time. <clears throat> and we're trying to converge at a certain point and everything needs to line up. And if the unit of measure is continually changing, how do I make good decisions and how do I accurately hit the mark? The same thing is true as an investor or a business person. I'm making financial decisions about allocation of capital and I'm trying to hit certain returns on investment and I need to hit certain liquidity points and I have to be able to count on the value of that dollar and the dollar is constantly changing and I can't. I mean, how'd you like to be an airline, you know, trying to figure out how to manage your airfare and you put your prices out there and you're selling tickets two, three, four months in advance and you have no idea what the cost of oil is going to be. And the way you secure that is you purchase future contracts that make people guarantee delivery to you and you pay a premium for it. You pay more than you would if you bought it today, but at least you know what it's going to be and you can make your plans around that. And that's what airlines have to do. And so it's the same thing as investors. We have to try to find a way to put as much stability into our, into our, uh, uh, financial decision making as we possibly can. And precious metals is an opportunity to insulate yourself uh, from a falling dollar. But it's not an investment because an investment, by our definition, has to produce income. Okay. And gold doesn't do that. No, not at all. But and the, you just answered a second question that we get a number of questions about. Now you know how Jay uses precious metals. Yay. So it's been answered uh, there too. And more importantly, than all of that is, it, you know, for 
understand why you bought the darn thing in the first place. You bought gold for a reason, but if you bought it at thinking it's an investment, that was the faulty premise from the beginning. If you bought it for a completely different reason, uh, capital preservation being one, then you're probably on the right track. So with all of this being said, how do how does the Fed fit in? How do I respond when I hear, you know, Janet Yellen or whomever is there uh, saying, you know, whatever they're saying in terms of easing or printing or, or how do I interpret that information and take measurable action? And where do I put my capital first? OK, yes, I'm going to get you to the answer to that question. But what I what I want to drive home for you is many of you have heard me talk about the dip process, data to information to interpretation process. <laughs> That's what the P stands for. Never thought of anything cute to make the P stand for something else. Here's the point. You hear us talking a lot about data and some information. The key words is to understand that when you take in information, you've got to get to the point to where you interpret it, i.e. figure out what do I do with it? How can I use this information to increase the size of my portfolio, increase my cash flow, decrease my expenses, whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish, it must be something along those lines that you must be thinking when you consume that information on how to use it. This is one way that you can get a whole lot more out of the information that you do consume, be that a book, a course, a tape, a seminar, no matter what you go to or go through, by applying this simple process, you'll know what to do regardless of the economic conditions. I certainly hope you are enjoying what you are hearing. And I'm going to get you right back to it. Well, I think, first of all, it's just understanding the basics of, of what, the, what the most important thing that, that they're doing affects you. And um, they're manipulating interest rates. And the way they do that is by printing money to purchase bonds in the open market. And so the idea of a bond yield is inverse to the bond price. And this is it's such a simple concept, but it takes a long time for people to get their mind around. Um, and, and the best way I've found to do it is just to play with the numbers yourself. So if you were to take, say, a, you know, on a calculator, say $100,000, you would say, okay, I want to get a 5% yield or annual yield or interest on that. What would it throw off? And you take $100,000 times 0.05 and you get $5,000. So that would be a $5,000 yield. If you were to pay $200,000 for that bond, then, and you were to only get $5,000, then you would divide the 5,000 by the 200 and you would find out that the higher bond price, 200,000, created a lower bond yield, 2.5%. And when you do the math, you'll see that. Then if you were to reverse it and say, well, what if I only paid $50,000 for that bond and it was giving me $5,000? You would see that that was a 10% and your interest double. So just that little exercise right there, if you do it on a piece of paper with a calculator yourself, you will see that the higher the bond price, the lower the yield, and the lower the uh, bond price, the higher the yield. And the yield is the interest rate. Interest rates are risk premiums paid by people in the financial community. And so the lowest possible risk should have the lowest possible interest rate. And the lowest possible risk, the way most people think of it, are government-backed bonds, and the U.S. government in particular, because the U.S. government is allegedly the strongest economy in the world and the least likely to default. And so if you have zero chance of default, your risk premium is very small. Therefore, uh, the yields are going to be small. And that's kind of the way it works. Mortgages are considered to be very safe also, not quite as safe. And so they move out the ring of risk to a slightly higher rate. And so when I was in the mortgage business and a lot of people in the mortgage business pay attention to 10-year treasury yields and most mortgage pricing pivots off of that or a thing called LIBOR, which is basically the London interbank offer rate. And that's uh, that was started really so American and uh, I'm sorry, European investors could relate to uh, risk pricing in bonds. All right. So you hear a lot about LIBOR and you hear a lot about T bills in the mortgage business. And of course, that's bringing it back full circle to real estate. So if the Fed comes out and says, we're going to ease, we're going to do quantitative easing, that means they're going to purchase bonds. And if you understand basic supply and demand, when somebody bids for something, a purchaser, that increases the demand and drives the price up. We've already discovered if the price of the bond goes up, the yield goes down. So the more active the Fed is in purchasing bonds, what effectively they're trying to do is push down interest rates. 
And then you have to ask yourself all the political reasons why they would want to do that. And we can talk about that a little bit if you'd like to. You can also talk about the disconnect between what they say and what they do. And this concept of tapering that we hear all about is this notion that uh, at the height of the quantitative easing, they were purchasing $85 billion per month of treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. And this was their way of creating liquidity in those bond markets so that money could make its way to banks for lending and to mortgages to stimulate the housing. And this is an important thing to understand. We've been saying for years, even before the crash, that if there ever was a crash in real estate and up until 2008, there hadn't been, not not of this magnitude. But if there ever was, that the government and the Fed, which aren't the same thing, and industry would all come together and literally do anything necessary to prop up housing. Because too many people's balance sheets were dependent upon the collateral, meaning the value of those properties. And when those properties went down in value, people would walk away on the loans. And of course, we saw that happen. Huge numbers of strategic defaults. They couldn't pump those values back up fast enough. Now, with uh, well, well, and I, I get you, but you... How does that affect me? I'm the normal investor. I'm just trying to get a, a single family house. I'm just trying to figure out what to do with my, you know, 401k, my IRA. That's great. That's in Washington, right? I, I'm not in Washington. How does that affect nope. me? Yeah, well, the interest rates are in Main Street. So uh, pre-crash, um, we were proponents of adjustable rate loans. Interest rates in the marketplace were um, reasonably fair. They weren't overly subsidized. There wasn't quantitative easing going on. So the pricing did not involve a uh, fake buyer. You only had real market participants pricing out the Mm -hmm. bonds, and that's where the interest rates came from. And it looked like interest rates would be stable or trend down, and there was no point in paying a premium to lock in 30-year rates when you were buying a piece of property, especially if your intention was to be out of the property in three years, five years, seven years. And so we were big proponents of those adjustable loans. And that turned out to be good decisions in 2002, 2003, 2004, because interest rates continued to went down, and people who had those were okay. Well, today, interest rates are at really record lows. I mean, they've come up a little bit off the bottoms, and there's a little bit of a discussion there, too. But today, I would be much more inclined to use fixed financing for the longest period possible because there's a great concern that the Fed is going to lose control of the bond market. In other words, if if you understand as a bond market participant like China or somebody who's coming in and purchasing U.S. treasuries and you're recognizing that one of the major buyers in the marketplace is the Federal Reserve and the Fed is buying those bonds with money it just printed, which is devaluing the value of the dollar that you are going to get paid back in. If you end up in a situation like you have in Europe with Mario Draghi and you've got negative real interest rates. In other words, inflation is higher than the interest rates you're getting paid. How much investing are you going to do when you're getting a negative yield on your investment? The answer is none. Not much. (laughs) But couldn't you make the argument already? And I'm I'm just saying, couldn't you make the argument already that uh, that is actually already in existence? It just may not be commonly available knowledge? Well, I mean, it's all very commonly available. Most of the things I comment on, as you know, Jay, I pull right from mainstream news. The information is readily available. The context is what's missing. People read the news. They don't know what it means because they don't understand the basic mechanics. But again, the, I mean, I just described the inverse relationship of bond versus yield. And if you understand the role of the Fed in the open market committee, you know that there is nothing holding the Fed accountable to the size of its balance sheet or the government accountable to how much spending it does because the Fed can print unlimited amounts of money, uh, then and, and then you just have to understand the, the dynamics of buyers coming into the market going, do I want to get paid back down the road uh, in, in weaker dollars? And so, so this, this is a huge decision. You know, you should be coming back to this Main Street question mm-hmm. because if the dollar is falling and you're going to get paid back later with devalued dollars, you you want to be a borrower who pays back with cheaper dollars, or do you want to be a lender who's going to get paid back in cheaper dollars? Who do you want to be? Yeah, you want to be you the want to borrower. borrower. You want to borrow as much as you can because the Fed is taking care of borrowers. Who's the biggest debtor in the world? 
the United States of America. Who is served when the dollar falls so they get to pay back that debt with a cheaper dollar? The U.S. The U.S. controls the reserve currency of the world. The U.S. is, is, is really being reviled around the world for its monetary policy. You know, in this report that I did, there was a theme of last year's summit. I, I chronicled over 22 different deals, all out of mainstream news. None of this is like tinfoil hat stuff. It's like right out of Reuters, Bloomberg, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, readily available for anybody to see these deals that have been going down since 2010. Uh, because if you recall, uh, Jay, you were in the mentoring club back at that time, yeah. and I did the clues in the news where uh, Premier, the Premier of China came and really rebuked President Obama about monetary policy in the U.S. and said, you, know, you need to make sure we've got trillions of dollars invested in your bonds. You need to take care of the dollar because we can't, you can't pay us back in, in, in uh, diluted dollars. Right. And but, we, but we didn't take care of it. And so they went and cut a deal with Russia and they've cut a deal with Australia. They've cut deals with Europe. Uh, Chancellor Merkel just came back uh, from cutting deals. And these people are all getting out of the dollar. And so this is very, very important for real estate investors to know, because real estate investors of all in the types of investors on Earth have the greatest opportunity to profit from this. Because we have the opportunity to go in and get cheap government subsidized money called mortgages, secure it against a real asset that provides a real human need, not a fad, not something that's discretionary, not something that is going to uh, go away completely, either because of a technology or because uh, you know people have other priorities. There are very few things in life besides food and, and maybe clothing that, that go up as high that on the ladder is, is, is housing, is residential housing. And so we have an opportunity to purchase that, get tax deductions along the way, streams of income, and, and we can short the dollar effectively. And, and, and why would you want to short the dollar? You would short the dollar because you know that the Fed is committed to devaluing the dollar. And this is why the Fed policy matters, because if the Fed wasn't committed to that, then you would see interest rates uh, skyrocketing right now, which is what happened in the early 80s. The Fed was committed to saving the dollar. And in order to do that, Volcker had to let those interest rates go up to as high as 21 percent. And it was brutal, but it set the stage for a much stronger economy in the 80s. But it was tough, tough medicine to take at the time. We have been refusing as a nation to take that medicine. Mm. And Peter Schiff's argument is because we're refusing to do that when the when the, you know, the deal really comes home to roost, it's going to be really, really painful. And, and right. so, it, but that and that's and that's the point. You've heard me say things like before: all problems accrue interest and grow larger over time. And exactly. at, right now, we're kicking the can, but because you and I necessarily can't stop the can from being kicked, we still need to live. We still need to eat. We need to be doing things that position us so that when it's actually time to pay the piper, so to speak, we're in a position to not just survive, but thrive. So, yeah, I mean, if you think about it, you know, for example, if you were to go get a hundred thousand dollar mortgage on a little rental property somewhere, instead of paying that mortgage down to save four and a half or five percent interest on the loan or improve your cash flow, you were either to invest in a cash flowing instrument if you needed the cash flow. Uh, to be secure in the mortgage that you know paid a much higher yield that's arbitraging or making making money on the spread between the, the uh, pay down you know the five percent note rate versus a ten or twelve percent yield on you know oil or whatever else you might choose to buy that's one way to go the other thing is you could take that same investment capital and buy a few ounces of gold if if Jim Rickards is right he wrote the currency wars and the death of money he thinks gold could be as high as twenty thousand dollars an ounce you know, before too long. If, in fact, that were to happen, five ounces of gold would pay that mortgage off. Suddenly, I feel the need to go buy some gold. Um, yeah. I mean, <laughs> no, there's no guarantee that that's going to happen. But, I, again, you just have to right. look at the track record of the dollar. So this is the concept. you know, Use mortgages to short the dollar, acquire real estate, but also have some assets uh, you know, money stored, which I would say precious metals, so that – you know. When the crash comes and the real estate values collapse, the lesson learned last time is that the asset values collapsed a lot farther than the incomes did, which meant that if you were relatively conservatively structured and you had good cash flow markets, and Jay, I know you're a cash flow investor, and I know the markets you invest in, and 
of course, are markets that we've been proponents of also, is when you've got those strong cash flows, you're going you're gonna to be able to weather that storm. But more importantly, you reach onto your balance sheet now and you have assets that didn't collapse that you could immediately convert into liquid capital to go purchase these assets at a discount. You know, the shopping spree is on. We're, we're at the tail end of the shopping spree that we've been in. You know, we've got maybe another two or three years and in, uh, in, in a few really good cash flow markets where you can purchase at or below replacement costs. And I think the local economies and infrastructure are robust enough that, that they're going to be actually magnets of people and industry in a downturn, which is a whole different thing about due diligence and real estate markets. Uh, but, but there's going to be a lot of bargains in the street uh, the next cycle. And you know the lesson I learned last time and why I'm such a vociferous a teacher on this topic is because I personally got crushed. I was over leveraged. I was uh, hemorrhaging cash on my real estate portfolio, relying upon the strength of the income from my mortgage business to supplement. And when my mortgage company got hit extremely hard by what happened, you know, in, in the subprime market in the mortgage industry, and a lot of the types of loans we were making, those lenders were completely gone. I didn't have any way to place business or make money. All of a sudden, those negative cash flow properties were millstones around my neck, and I wasn't in a position to take advantage of all the wonderful bargains. Well, rather than quit the business, I said, well, I'm going to get the lesson, and I'm going to gear up for the next go-round because there will be another go-round. And so we don't need to be afraid of it as real estate investors. We just need to be smart. And the thing you don't want to do, I think, is you don't want to be exposed to adjustable loans. You don't want to have super thin cash flow markets. You don't want to be in speculative markets or tertiary markets that don't have strong infrastructure. And you want to have things on your balance sheet that are likely to benefit from a falling dollar that can be quickly converted into cash so you can purchase assets at bargain prices when the crash comes. And that's, again, what the whole real asset investing philosophy is all about. Now, right there. Everybody, that's a quick sum. You probably have understood that uh, we, we could continue talking for a very long time. And there's a there's so much information to be learned. Don't feel overwhelmed that you didn't get it all. In fact, uh, the real estate guys often uh, do an event. They do it once a year, and it is absolutely awesome. And if you like a sampling of what you've heard here, they have <laughs> they often assemble the absolute best people for you and I to always go and learn from and to be educated by in a week-long format where we get to shut off the cell phones, focus on the what's really going on, and be able to make finally good, excellent financial decisions, and we come back and execute every day. Um, could you share with us a little bit uh, about some of the information and the guests that have been on your summit at sea and, and just... All the things that tend to happen there, because I know for me, it's been a, it's a, it's been a transformational experience to be able to absorb the, inf the absorb the content, come back home, make decisions, etc. But I, I would love to hear it in your own words as well. Well, I mean, the, you know, the vision for the summit, the term summit is used by design. A summit is a high point. It's a pinnacle. It's, it's the ultimate. And this really is the ultimate. Uh, event for real estate investors because a lot of real estate conferences are all about tactical things that a lot of your technical advisors can help you with. It's about upselling you to books and tapes and additional classes. A lot of times it's open to um, you know anybody, which is okay. I mean, that stuff needs to be available, but this is a relatively high-priced event, which means everybody there is a serious, serious investor. Uh, sometimes you know it, you got to pay a little bit to be in the room with the right people. And uh, Jay, you know, you know from experience that it's not just the content that's powerful here, but it's who's in the room, you know, and and this is power networking like you can't believe. If you ever went to summer camp when you were a kid, you know, you, you get into your little camp house and you don't know anybody. And by the end of the week, you're best friends forever and you can't wait to see each other again. And so we get a huge we've been doing this for 12 years. 2015 will be our 13th year. Uh, and, and in the beginning, it was primarily real estate and we were primarily the teachers and we, after the crash, uh, expanded it to be a lot more about the, uh, the macroeconomics and, uh, different types of investing. Cause it, you know, we are real estate investors, but before real estate, we're investors. We have to deal with cash. We have to deal with economics. We have to deal with estate planning and insurance. I and mean, there's so many different things we have to deal with to just be myopic and only think about real estate. Where, how do you integrate all these things? 
So the vision for the summit is to put together a faculty to cover a lot of different topics and give you an environment where you get to mingle with them. So over the last many years, we, we had G. Edward Griffin, the author of The Creature from Jekyll Island. We had him for an entire week. Same time, we had Robert and Kim Kiyosaki for an entire week. Uh, and and uh, that was, I think, uh, 2012, our 10th year anniversary. We you know, often have a lot of the Rich Dad advisors coming back next year for the sixth year in a row. Is Ken McElroy, who is Robert Kiyosaki's uh, personal real estate partner and, and advisor. Uh, you know, Andy Tanner, his stock advisor, you know, and say, well, yeah, but I'm a real estate investor. What do I care about stocks? If you're out there syndicating capital and you're trying to convince somebody what in a red hot stock market, why they might want to think about getting out of paper assets into real assets, it's pretty good idea to know how to talk the language. Right, so they right. just don't think you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, we've got Peter Schiff, who is the uh, CEO and global strategist for Euro Pacific Capital. He is the guy who wrote a book called Crash Proof and predicted that the uh, real estate meltdown, and he got it right, and he got the timing right, and he got the reasons right. And after we discovered that book, sadly, after the fact, <laughs> uh, we made it our mission not only to get to know him, uh, but to get him, make him available to our people. So he's coming back now for his third year in a row. And uh, he's a guy that you, you can look all over YouTube and find just Google Peter Schiff is right. And you'll find all kinds of videos of him being mocked and ridiculed for his doom and gloom predictions in 2005 and 2006, which turned out to be absolutely prophetic. Uh, so uh, it's a lot of fun. I mean, we spend two days in a hotel room before we get on the ship. And we're going to sail out of Miami in 2015. And then we have three days of classrooms, you know, eight hours a day on the ship three port days. One day we do a shore excursion where we do an educational event this year. We're going to be in Puerto Rico where Peter Schiff just moved his asset management company to take advantage of a really cool tax arrangement between Puerto Rico and the United States. His tax effective tax rate went from 50% to four. Wow. Good. Uh, and his personal attorney who set that up is going to be just, just, uh, just closed him on being a part of the fact that he's not even up on the website yet. He will be shortly, uh, but Jeffrey Verdon will be with us uh, talking about how to develop an international deal. This last year in 2014, Jay, as you know, we had Simon Black and I don't know if Simon's going to be coming back or not. We're, we're hoping he will, but we've got a couple other people, but Simon is a guy, we spent a lot of time talking about international. And Simon is a guy who's really taken this concept of having an international diversification. Uh, and sometimes it's hard for real estate investors to get their mind around because they're like, oh, you know, well, I, I just invest in the United States or I just invest in my state or I just invest in my neighborhood. But, you know, we ask people all the time in our events, how many of you think, you know, investing outside the United States is risky? And half mm -hmm. the hands will go up. And then we ask the other people, how many of you think tying all of your family's financial future to one country and one country's currency is risky? And a whole different set of hands will go up. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's great about being on the summit is we have people from all over the world. Our podcast is heard in 180 countries. And so we get people from London, from Europe. In fact, in 2012, we were talking to guys that had been through a currency collapse in the former Soviet Union. Yep. We talk about what it would be like to go through a currency collapse. We, we, we theorize about it. These guys actually went through it. Right. And to be able to sit there and have dinner with them and talk with them at the beach, you know, that's the other short excursion that we do as a beach day. We just get to hang out. Uh, we get to build relationships with people. I have friends all over the world right now, and I get an international perspective on things. And, you know, you think, oh, I'd be nervous to invest in real estate in uh, New Zealand. And we talked to the couple from New Zealand. They're like, I'd be nervous to invest in the United States. <laughs> what? Really? Oh, yeah. The United States. I mean, New Zealand has a lot. It's a lot more peaceful. There's a lot more crime in the United States. I mean, it's just it's all paradigms. And so the summit is an opportunity to get those paradigms broken, to get a chance to build uh, relationships. And, you know, at the risk of uh, you know, making a bad pun, it's a chance to practice total immersion <laughs> on because you're locked on a cruise ship for a week with everybody. And, you know, Jay, you know, we, we create a cocoon. It's social. Yeah. Uh, it's educational. There are roundtables, discussion groups. You know, we rotate the faculty or actually we rotate you during dinner so that each faculty member. Jay, you're a faculty member. This will be your, I think, second year as a faculty member and your fourth year as a summiteer. So you've experienced it from both sides. Uh, but I, I mean, but I mean, I just know, I mean, I'm not going to talk about the business relationships that you've developed, some of which I'm aware of, and there's probably some I'm not even aware of. But I do know that after the 2012 summit, you got a chance to meet Robert Kiyosaki a week later. You were standing on stage with him on, and live cast all over the world 
Yeah, that was. And I'm not saying that you know I'm not saying that's going to happen to everybody, but I'm saying that if you stay home, it's definitely not. (laughs) You got to put yourself in a position to get lucky. Yeah. And you know when you when you know there's going to be 180 people of the right people from all over the world, if you want to build an international network of friends that are serious real estate investors from all over the world, and you want to get to know some of the thought leaders on a personal level uh, in the areas of finance and estate planning and real estate investing, I can't think of any place on earth you could go to get more done faster than the summit. And on, on that note, you forgot one very important thing. There's a cash flow game. Oh, yeah. Jay leads our cash flow game. In fact, that's a great story. So check this out. Have you ever told them the story before, Jay? No, go for it. It's it's a great story. So so we have Robert and Kim Kiyosaki coming on this summit, right? Nobody gets them for a week. We get them for a week. And, and just so you know, we've never paid a speaker on the summit ever. We don't pay any of our speakers. So Robert and Kim came because we've just developed a friendship over the years. They're very supportive of who we are, what we do. We have a great working relationship. They brought all their advisors, so that was great. And you know, they did a lot of meetings and did some team building stuff, which is another reason why you might want to come. But we decided we were going to do a cash flow game. We played cash flow before. We said, how great would it be to play cash flow with Robert Kiyosaki? So we go to Robert. We say, Robert, will you, you, you know, will you proctor the cash flow game? And Robert's like, no. <laughs> so, so I get picked to do it, and I'm sitting there thinking, oh my gosh! I mean, you know. I mean, I play cash flow, but I mean, to proctor cash flow game in front of Robert Kiyosaki, I was just like scared to death, right? So Jay had done it for us the year before and had done a ridiculous job. It was amazing. And so I said, Jay, how about this? How about you do it? <laughs> and so Jay, Jay's a great guy. And this, what, I got to tell you, this one thing you have to understand. It would have been really easy for him to say no. He could have said no. But he said yes, even though he was scared, even though there was a risk. Yeah. And it got a little riskier, right? You remember when Robert was up there and he was yeah, explaining yeah. to everybody about the game and he was going off about people who changed the game. And, of course, you're notorious for doing what? Like right? changing, the changing the game. game. Changing the game. <laughs> and, you know, it's funny because, uh, you know, you turned white, which is not an easy thing for you to do. Not at all. Uh, but the, but all the blood went out of your face and you were sitting there right before you were ready to go on. You had your PowerPoint, you had your whole shtick scheduled to go. And there's Robert and Kim. And uh, but God bless you. You went for it. You did it. You crushed it. And it was fabulous. And he became a big J Massey fan. You guys became friends. You were on his radio show. He invited you to come to his event. And, you know, who knows where else that might go? I mean, it's always hard to keep Robert's attention for more than a little bit. But uh, but man, I mean, that there's a lesson about that. Sometimes you get given an opportunity and you don't maybe feel like up to the challenge and you have a split second to make a decision. And what you decide to do in that split second can, can change your life. And I really think, Jay, you made the right decision. I commend you for your courage and really thank you on a personal level for saving me. <laughs> yes, I haven't looked at it that way as saving you. But if you say that that's what happened. Then that's what happened. Well, I mean, you know, see, I mean, I see somebody might listen to this and go, oh, yeah, but Russ, you should have done it. it would have been your chance. I was already in a relationship with Robert. I already was, you know, one of the co-producers of the event. So I already had a position. I had nowhere to go but down. Whereas Jay had, you know, was just one of the guys. And for him to stand out in the crowd, he had nowhere to go but up. And he and he killed it. It was great. Awesome. I I appreciate that. I remember that. I remember how how fast it all happened. And then when he asked me, he was like, yeah, I, I want you to go to go on stage with me in San Jose. I remember looking at my wife going, I don't know how we're going to figure that part out. Cause we're in the middle of the ocean right now. And he wants us there in a few days, but we will figure it all out. And it's, I, I've always appreciated the support that you and as well as Robert, et cetera, uh, give, because it's, it, it can be lonely being an entrepreneur sometimes. And when you're looking for those mentors, you never know where you're going to find them. In this case, found you guys in iTunes. And don't forget, guys, that they've got a great podcast. Now, Russ, I, I just got to ask, with all of this being in flux, with all of these things coming down, if, if I wanted to get more information quickly to be able to get caught up to speed on what you call real assets, I know that you've got a report. Could you tell us a little bit about it and how we can go get it? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I actually wrote this report for the 2013 or 14 summit. And it's called Real Asset Investing, How to Grow and Protect Your Wealth in the Face of a Falling Dollar. And it's uh, not light reading. It's about 37 pages. But if you're really interested in the topic, it's very helpful. And it just talks about not just real estate, but real asset investing. So there talks about gold, it talks about oil, it talks about farmland. And I think more importantly, it talks, it, it sets the table of context and then shows how to integrate all these things into a portfolio. So uh, you can get a copy of that free at real asset at realestateguysradio.com, real asset at realestateguysradio.com. Or you can just visit our website at realestateguysradio.com. And under the resources tab, you'll see a whole library of special reports that you can uh, download for free. So, uh, Make yourselves uh, make yourselves at home. Indeed, indeed. And if you had just one last thing to say, remember, now you're putting on the superhero uniform. You've survived many different economic situations. You've read all the books. You know what to do. Someone, though, who is listening for the first time or considering, should I, shouldn't I, does real estate fit? What would you do to give them the confidence that they needed to know what to do for themselves? What would be the one thing? What's that piece of magic advice that's going to make it all work for him? I think it was Henry Ford that said, if you believe you can or you believe you can't, you're right. And sometimes, you know, you look at some of this stuff and you think this is so complex. This is so big. It's so overwhelming. It's easier to stay stuck in your rut. Don't let that little voice in your head tell you you can't. You absolutely can. It's learnable and you can learn to do it, but you have to put in the time and effort to do it. The great news is you live in a time in history where podcasts like this are available. The internet brings so much information. There is a lot of noise, that's for sure. But if you if you avail yourself of all of these resources and just start putting good ideas in your head and then take advantage of networking events like we just talked about and others that are out there and refine your thought processes by talking to people, don't worry about looking stupid. Stupid is not learning. Just get out there and start talking. Everybody has opinions, but your opinion is just as valid as anybody else's. You know, learn it, shape it, sharpen it against other people's opinions. And if you do that, it won't take long before you're going to be an expert in your subject. So if you believe you can, you can. And if you believe you can't, you can't believe you can. Indeed. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you know what that means. It is time for you to move at the speed of instruction. There have been numerous resources given to you. Yes, realestateguysradio.com. Go to the resources tab. Download all the reports, not just the real asset report. Get them all. Read them all. And more importantly, move at the speed of instruction and do what they suggest because it doesn't matter. Nothing changes until you do. And more importantly, you put your name on a contract and buy some real assets. Ladies and gentlemen, I tell you, it has been fun having this conversation with you one more time. I know you learned a lot and your head is probably about to explode. Take it all in. We will be back talking to you soon. I look forward to talking to you guys. Until next time. Thank you for investing your time with Jay Massey and the Cash Flow Diary. When you have a moment, please visit iTunes and leave a positive comment about the show. And go now to our website, CashflowDiary.com, to take advantage of our free business building course, Cash Flow Foundation. Gain the knowledge, understanding, and skill that will teach you how to never need a job again. Until next time. Until next time. Until next time.